James Michener, in his monumental work, The Source, published in 1965, places his novel in Israel at an archaeological dig. The framework of the book describes archaeologists at a tell, a hill, and they sink a shaft from surface to bedrock. And then they look at the layers, layer upon layer, of culture that has been put there. And, and they researched and watched for signs of what the culture was all about, and particularly the religious customs and beliefs of the people who lived there. The work, of course, is fictional, but it's well-researched, and the reader has the sense that this might have happened just this way. Michener writes of a fictional town at the Tell whose gods included both Moloch and Ashtoreth, two gods that had already been around for centuries across various cultures, known by various names. Moloch was the fire god, and he was the god of death. Ashtoreth, the goddess of fertility and life. Mishner's descriptions of the worship practices were graphic. He tells that priests would walk through the village, choosing the children who would be sacrificed to Moloch. With a red dye, they marked the wrists of the baby boys who would three days later be offered. The town would then gather at the altar of Moloch, a huge stone idol with a great open mouth. A fire inside the statue served as a furnace and a stone incline made it possible for the priest to lift a child high while chanting incantations, and then they dropped him into the fire. Parents whose children were offered were honored that their child had been chosen for sacrifice in service of the town. They must also have experienced shock and horror and grief and loss. The second half of the worship included fertility rites to ensure good harvest and prosperity for the community, a visible cycle of death and life. In Hosea's day, the northern kingdom of Israel had forsaken the God of Abraham, and they were worshiping other gods. When Israel worshiped other gods, it wasn't as if they simply changed denominations. This was infidelity an abandonment of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. That's what the book of Hosea is all about. It's an interesting bit of history, but what does it have to do with us? Our world is certainly not the ancient, primitive, superstitious world of Hosea and Gomer, and certainly not the world of Baal and Moloch and Ashtoreth. So, how do we think and how do we speak of God? How do we understand with our finite minds? What kind of God do we worship? In the 1950s, J.B. Phillips wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. His contention was that because God is infinite and far beyond our understanding, we try to reduce God to something we can manage, something that we can control. I have sat across the room listening for lo these many years in counseling sessions. One of the things that I listen for is a person's concept of God. Sometimes I will ask questions originally formulated by James Fowler uh, the guru of faith development. These are some of his questions. To what do you give your highest allegiance? What is of ultimate concern? Where do you spend your time, your energy, your resources? What is your greatest joy? In what or whom do you place your deepest trust? In what or whom is your most exuberant hope? These are questions of eternal significance, and they give a pretty fair picture of a, a person's concept of God. 
For some people, God is the great Santa Claus in the sky. You may have heard TV preachers preaching prosperity theology. God wants you healthy and wealthy. God wants to prosper you. What do you most want? Name it and claim it. It is yours straight from God's hand. Usually the way we can get those blessings is by sending money to the TV preacher. He may or may not guarantee results. I remember years ago, Tammy Faye standing at the, in front of the cameras with her thick makeup and her big hair, and she was saying something like this, God has just blessed me so good. I never knew what I wanted more, a big house with an ocean view or a big house with a swimming pool, and now I have both. As it turned out, she also had an air-conditioned dog house and gold-plated fixtures in her many bathrooms. I don't mean to pick on Tammy Faye. She was told and she believed that she was just so like spiritual that God just like wanted to bless her real good. Wow, where do I sign up? Just think, all I have to do is send my money to TV preachers and my life is going to be a bowl of cherries from here on out. But God as Santa Claus doesn't square with my life experience. Some people see God as the great punishing parent. They live under the dictum that God's going to get you. They live cowering under fear and dread of God's wrath. Step out of line, they say, and you'll get zapped. Nothing good ever happens to these people, and when the bad things happen, they are attributed to a vicious, vindictive, avenging God who obviously takes pleasure in seeing people suffer. Some people live their whole lives without ever having received parental approval, and it forever colors their concept of God. Some people see God as the great negotiator, sort of quid pro quo. What goes around comes around. It goes something like this. If I'm very good, if I go to church, give my money, don't cuss, drink, carouse, or chew, God will be pleased and will reward me, like getting smiley face stickers on your good behavior chart. Then nothing bad will ever happen to me, but inevitably something bad does happen, and then we are left with the sense that either we didn't have faith enough or God didn't hold up his end of the bargain. And what kind of a God is that? <laughs> 